Southwest Washington woodturners, Cascade woodturners, and Northwest woodturners would like to welcome you to an evening with Richard Raffin. The famed turner is coming to us from his home in Australia and will enlighten us on his life, his career, his inspirations, and his words of wisdom that will encourage us to explore our own creativity and broaden our skill sets. Thank you, Richard, for sharing with us. Please take it away. Right, so I'm often asked um, how I got into turning and, and also uh, how to make a living from turning. Uh, so this really is a brief history of my life as a turner, uh, starting with the background. Um, now, I was never a hobby turner and I left school intending to be an artist, um, but two years of art school put paid to that. And uh, then I had a few months uh, doing landscape gardening, uh, followed by six months with a really shonky real estate agent. I didn't discover that for about six years. Um, and after that, I had 18 months with a small craft-based uh, manufacturer, uh, where I learned an awful lot about making stuff efficiently and uh, running a small business. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, and I was being trained to kind of run the thing, um, but I needed to get out and about in the world. Uh, so in 1964, uh, I went to London to work for a London wine shipper, and uh, in that business, I went through most of the departments. I went through the cellars, did some deliveries, I was in the order office for about a year, accounting, um, and then the retailing area. And uh, age 24, I found myself overseeing 10 retail stores. Uh, I was extremely well paid and well on top of the job, but I'm not really a city person and the job wasn't that fulfilling. Um, so in 1969, I was thinking of uh, moving away from London to somewhere rural and starting my own business uh, and making something. Uh, I was 26, uh, I was single, I was without debt, uh, and I was unaware that there was a craft revival underway even though my sister Nicola, uh, who was a potter making domestic stoneware, uh, was part of that. Now, I was considering uh, buying a picture framing business uh, when Nicola suggested wood turning and that I could go and learn from Douglas Hart, who had a wood turning business near where she'd done part of her training. And my instant response was, yep, I'll be a wood turner. Now, I knew absolutely nothing about wood turning other than it involved uh, a lathe and making lumps of wood round using tools with long handles. I had actually seen the lathe with a small manufacturing company. Anyway, uh, in that instant, I just seemed to know intuitively that I enjoy the craft uh, and that all I had to do was develop good technical skills, uh, apply what I'd learned uh, about running businesses, uh, having been uh, in several and seen them close up, uh, and then I'd earn a decent living uh, by selling what I enjoyed designing and making. And that's pretty much what I've done uh, since May 1970. Uh, I started off in England, in the west of England. And then since January 1982, I've been in Australia. Uh, at the time, it never crossed my mind that Douglas Hart might not want an apprentice, uh, which he didn't. Now, late in 1969, uh, there were very few options for anyone wanting to learn how to turn wood. Uh, I did find a five-year apprenticeship on a low wage, uh, but I felt I was a bit too old for that at 26. Uh, and I knew I wouldn't learn very much, or certainly not enough, from the two weekend courses which were advertised in the woodworking magazines. So I went back to Douglas Hart and suggested that I pay him for a year's tuition and he could retain whatever I made to sell. Uh, that deal appealed to him. Um, and I began my new career on the 5th of January in 1970. Uh, I was put on a Myford ML8, uh, ML8 lathe, uh, which only had an 18th swing. Um, and I set about making handles for the uh, tools which I was about to purchase. Uh, when it came to it, I actually earned very little from Douglas Hart, but I earned a huge amount watching Bill Crang, who did all the turning uh, in that workshop while Douglas ran his one-man courier business. At the most, I got five minutes of hands-on each day, 
Uh, Bill wasn't supposed to help me at all. Um, but if I had a series of catches, he'd be scurrying over with a kind of, what are you up to now? Um, and I'd get a, not like that, like this. And he'd show me quickly what to do. And then five seconds later, he'd be back off to his lathe. But the major advantage of that workshop was that every day I absorbed the pace and the production of the workshop uh, and the sounds of a competent turner. And best of all, I could actually see how long it takes uh, to turn a bowl or a plate or whatever he was making. And then tearing up at the end of each day, I could compare my shavings to his. So I knew what to aim for from the various timbers. Uh, we did uh, an 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. day with uh, 30 minutes for lunch and there were a couple of coffee breaks, one morning, one afternoon. And uh, actually I took to wood turning like a duck to water. Uh, and I was able to turn this uh, cross grain box uh, in about three hours, uh, but only six weeks after I first got on the, uh, on the lathe. So I felt I was making some progress there. Um, I left the workshop after four months, feeling I knew more than enough, or maybe just enough, to set up on my own. Uh, Douglas had been worrying about who would replace me in my production uh, when I moved on, so that was a load off his mind. So in May 1970, I set up on my own, and here I am. Um, I was turning stuff that would sell easily, uh, as well as provide me with practice. I was still painfully slow, uh, and uh, daily I was heaving bowls and plates and scoops um, off the lathe. Uh, I broke several rests with catches. Um, so I had a staggering amount to learn, and at that time I had no idea quite how much. I'd purchased this Coronet Major lathe, which I realized almost immediately was a, a mistake, a bad investment and almost immediately um, ordered a Harrison graduate, uh, which at that time took three months to arrive. And it was about the only decent lathe on the market, um, which I could afford. The others were over, uh, over a thousand. But anyway, it was well worth the wait. And uh, whilst I was waiting for that to arrive, um, I went through three lots of bearings on the coronet and broke a faceplate. Uh, so I was relieved when the graduate came and three years later I had uh, uh, three of them and they did me very well until the mid 1980s. At first I was turning rolling pins and dozens of scoops through uh, which I also learned to hollow end grain. Um, a London uh, ceramic store, a uh, specialist store buying pottery from my sister, stored this very scoop uh, in her kitchen and ordered four dozen, uh, which was my first big order. Um, it took me over a week to make, uh, and then six weeks later, they ordered another four dozen. I turned a lot of small bowls to go with the scoops, uh, and I refined my use of gouges and scrapers, uh, turning plates and breadboards, uh, and there were bowls. These are my first two bowls. Light pools uh, provided gouge and skew chisel practice. Uh, in Britain at that time, and probably still, uh, bathroom lights had to have a pool cord. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so I felt there should be a market um, for, the, uh, for the pool cords, and indeed there was. All the scoops and small end grain blanks uh, were held in a cup chuck at that time. Face work. Uh, I used a standard screw faceplate, which came with the lathes, uh, or we used shops, uh, shop made screw chucks. Um, and I had a number 14 wood screw in those, protruding about half an inch. And they were generally about uh, six inches diameter. Uh, the modern self centering four jaw wood turning chucks were still 20 years away and uh, wood turning was yet to become a popular hobby. Uh, and with so few wood turners around, it meant that very few stores stopped turning tools. Uh, what turning tools there were were carbon steel, and bowl gouges like uh, these sorbies were particularly scarce at the time. 
So for nearly a year, I was turning bowls using a one inch shallow gouge um, made by Sorbis, uh, which I'd found at an army surplus store for a pound each, um, as opposed to the five pounds, which the deep fluted bowl gouges cost at the time. By mid-June 1970, I had samples to go with a catalogue and the price list I printed up, um, along with several boxes filled with one-off bowls that, uh, because of my ineptitude, basically, were barely remote cousins of anything in my catalogue. So with these in a box, I uh, set off to call on the small souvenir and gift shops, uh, which I'll call galleries, uh, which is what they became by the end of that decade. Uh, and I'd walk into a likely gallery with a box of bowls and have at least one out of the box, just as the owner was expressing a total lack of interest in any woodware. Fortunately, uh, the figure uh, on the English sycamore and the cherry I was offering uh, was so different to the universal teak that a minute later, all the bowls would be out and the gallery owner would be selecting a few just to see if they'd sell, usually along with a few scoops. Uh, and then the wonderful bit was they'd write me a check. Uh, and within two weeks, uh, four or five of the galleries wanted more one-off bowls. So I was up and running, um, having inadvertently created a nice little market for one-off bowls. Uh, until that time, Galleries like that really expected to order off a catalog and, uh, and that was that. Um, as it happened, uh, I then went out selling only twice and I discarded my catalogs. And I basically sold the same way ever since. In 1971, uh, I was accepted as a member of the Devon Guild of Craftsmen in, uh, in the West of England. Uh, it was a juried membership and the work had to be distinctive with a style that showed it was conceived by a particular maker rather than a copy of someone else's. And there wasn't really any traditional work in the group. Uh, it was a group of professionals and uh, gifted amateur craftsmen and women. Um, what I found interesting looking back was there wasn't anybody who called themselves an artist internationally renowned uh, craft icons like Bernard and David Leach, the potters, and Michael Cardew call themselves potters, uh, not ceramicists or ceramic artists. Weavers were weavers, they weren't fabric artists. Uh, and that was the environment in which I got established. Uh, they all had their production lines uh, and the best of that was put aside for exhibitions. There didn't seem to be kind of any concept uh, of creating exhibition work per se. All their work was good um, and they just put aside the best of uh, their best for the shows. Uh, and that's the example I, um, I've always followed. Let's just have a quick drink. Um, in the 1970s, um, bowls were made using face plates and screw holes were filled with plastic wood or some people put green bays over the bottom. That was really a complete no-no. Um, the holes didn't worry customers at all, uh, but I'm sure it pleased a few turners looking for something to criticize. Creating bowls without a pair of plugged holes uh, in the base added far too much cost with no, fi um, no financial benefit to me. So I really bothered until alternative ways of holding bowls came along a decade later uh, when the screw holes were replaced by a great big chuck rebate, um, which I consider to be almost as bad. Um, that rather brings us to pricing, uh, which is always a question people have. Now, I think the important thing is to know how long it should take to make a bowl, and I knew that. Um, and so I charged for the time uh, it should take rather than the time I did take. And to that, I added the replacement cost of the blank to arrive at a wholesale price. Retailers then doubled the price. Uh, and if I had any direct sales, they were pretty much a gallery retail price because you'd never undercut your galleries. Otherwise, they're not going to be at all happy. So to determine how long a bowl should take to turn, 
um, you can multiply the diameter by the height in inches, and that'll give you a pretty accurate time in minutes. So 12 by 4, 48 minutes, it's about right. Um, that's on a bad day when you're not feeling too good. Uh, 6 by 3, 18 minutes. And a professional would be making uh, bowls slightly faster than that, um, especially now in where we're, we're roughing out and that kind of thing. So I soon abandoned uh, all ideas of employing assistants and every month I'd have a day out uh, delivering the latest batch of work. And that way I got to know the people selling my work and I think that always helps with sales because they can relate the work to the individual making it. I've always had a policy of swapping back anything which hadn't sold. So there was never any dead stock on the gallery shelves. And uh, I knew that uh, what doesn't sell in one place will always sell somewhere else. All you have to do is find it. These bowls and platters uh, made for a good photo in uh, British Crafts, which was then a new magazine at the time. Um, but the bulk of most orders seem to consist of sugar bowls and scoops and quantities of scoops on their own, like these. Um, right through the 70s, I sold at least 200 scoops a month and they paid all my basic bills. I could produce about 50 to 60 two inch times of scoops, like the one in front left uh, in a day. And most galleries had a bowl of these near the till, so they were often impulse purchases. Uh, and I soon learned that uh, scoops hardly ever sell when they're displayed just in twos and threes, and anybody who did that just didn't sell them. Like many self-employed, um, I've always found it hard to refuse an order. So my problem has usually been keeping up with the orders I've got and delivering on time, um, but that's something you absolutely have to do if you're going to keep your customers, because if galleries can't lay hands on saleable stock when they need it, they go broke. It's a thing a lot of potential craftspeople don't seem to understand. This label went on the bottom of every bowl, uh, or a slight variation of it. Um, this is a, a more modern one, um, but I'm sure it's often clinched a sale. People want to know how to look after pieces. Late in 1970, um, I'm shocked looking back now that I was brazen enough to go and approach David Mellor's kitchen shop in Sloan Square in London. And David Mellor's sold literally tons of utilitarian pottery thrown by renowned studio potters. Um, Mellor went on to purchase probably half my production work until late 1981 when I moved to Australia. Um, typical is this teak bowl, uh, which I sold, found an invoice book in 1971 for £2.75, which I suppose at the time was about $8 US. Um, when teak suitable for bowls became almost, almost unobtainable in 1973, uh, we went to olive ash. Uh, the teak had all been, uns uh, had all been seasoned to come in from uh, Burma in boards whereas uh, the ash was green and I had to start rough turning bowls to speed up seasoning. So it was a whole different way of making stuff suddenly. Fortunately, ash was readily available and I had big logs milled locally, uh, usually into four inch thick boards from which I cut blanks at 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 inch diameter. Um, because I found standard sizing made invoicing and pricing easier, both for myself and the galleries. And galleries like bowls of the same price, but definitely different sizes. This was just easier to keep track of everything. In David Mellor's, these bowls were stacked up for high. Now, a bit about bowl walls. Uh, the top cross section is uh, probably the second bowl. Uh, I made, and it's classic of many of our early bowls. It's rather clunky, uh, angular inside, uh, all the weight in the base. The rim wasn't really considered, just kind of sanded over, and I was grateful to have finished the bowl. 
whereas most bowls I've turned subsequently have had cross sections similar to the lower three, uh, with the bowl wall thin in the midsection, and I find that makes for a nicely balanced bowl when you pick it up. Uh, I've never seen any particularly aesthetic merit in a thin, even wall thickness. Um, although if somebody then goes to the trouble of piercing it, um, I do appreciate the skill involved, but that's about it. So here I am, um, a fit young me, um, and this was pretty well much I was making in 1978. Uh, the bowls, boxes, breadboards, and scoops. Um, I had about a dozen customers, all of whom paid on invoice within 28 days. And the business was rolling along nicely. I never begrudged um, the gallery uh, uh, any marker um, because they all placed regular orders and I was doing okay out of it. Nobody even hinted at consignment or sale or return um, and only really did I swap over stock uh, after the first couple of orders established what would sell um, and what wouldn't in any given location. In 1974, uh, all my outlets bar one were in the southern half of England. Uh, but in 1975, I had orders from the Hand and the Spirit in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, there was a gallery in Boston who ordered some stuff. Uh, and I had two in Ireland, so I felt I could claim an international reputation. David Meller at that time wanted regular sizes and shapes, whereas everyone else, uh, they preferred the slight variations which you see in this stack of bowls. Uh, these were about 12 inch diameter and mostly sycamore by the look of it, or some act. Then in 1978, Craft Supplies UK opened for business. Um, and they introduced the Sorby high-speed steel tools. They had a connection with Sorby's. Uh, and this spigot chuck, um, which was designed to hold end grain blanks uh, for things like boxes and any small end grain projects. Uh, but Ray, Key and I instantly realized it was absolutely ideal for artsy little bowls that could be taken straight out of the chuck finished. Uh, and these were typical, um, each one had a foot turn to fit the chuck's collet, each turned in two fixings on the lathe. Uh, the collet could drip uh, a small bead at the top of the foot, and that made hollowing uh, the bowls on a tall foot a lot easier. And at the tail end of the 70s, uh, the craft revival was kind of in full swing, in London particularly, and the pressure was on to coming up with uh, something different. So I started experimenting with natural edges and, uh, and shaping rims. Uh, and then I realized that there's no good reason why bowls shouldn't be finished green uh, and allowed to warp. Um, and also that warping is controllable to some extent. And I should have known this from all the roughed out bowls I was doing. This holly bowl was dried on a cake rack uh, set on uh, top of a solid fuel stove. Um, because microwaves hadn't come on us yet, uh, but these days it would be microwave. Uh, around this time too, I dyed 60 or so holly bowls in bright colors, reds, yellows, greens, blues. Uh, and I had a solo exhibition, which I wittily entitled Hollywood in London. Um, it was quite garish. Uh, no photos of any of that work, because we didn't take many photos in the seventies. And that exhibition also included some chatter work uh, with some, uh, uh, which were on Coca-Cola rims. Um, it was a kind of fun exhibition and it sold out, uh, but I always regarded those bowls a bit of kind of commercial trumpery that won't stand the test of time, uh, unlike uh, this kind of thing, which I think will. Anyway, I invested five uh, in five tons of 12 to 16 inch, uh, 16 inch diameter holly logs uh, and made a lot of very thin wavy bowls. I got through most of this lot in about 18 months. Um, any splits uh, were detailed using a bandsaw and I took the bowl right on its side to make the cuts 
just cut into the bottom of the split uh, and then hand sanded the rest. And I made a lot of rocking bowls with rounded bases. Um, this apple bowl didn't actually warp. Um, uh, the rim was, uh, I'd started to cut and uh, cut rim, shape them. And this would have been done uh, on a 36 grit drum sander. Uh, whereas this one would have been cut on a bandsaw uh, and then finished uh, on the drum sander. And I traded this with David Ellsworth when I first met him. Cut rims um, led to squarish rims. And uh, my square bowls and plates are never actually dead square because I find that a bit too contrived. Um, apart from the fact it's quite difficult to do, get them dead square. So these room rims, uh, when you look from above, might look curved, but they're finished on a belt sander or disc sander. Uh, so they're actually flat in one plane. And at the tail end of the 1970s, uh, early 80s, uh, very thin was in vogue. Um, I suspect turning ultra thin didn't have so much to do with fulfilling a market demand uh, and a lot more to do with a few competent turners keeping the inept off the bandwagon. Um, wood turning was beginning to take off as a hobby uh, in Britain uh, and increasing competition, uh, which was appearing over the horizon, needed to be kept at bay. And I'm sure that's partly why I was doing it. Now we have spillicans or pickup sticks, uh, the game. My first set was uh, turned in response to a commission from John Makepeace uh, for his Parnham House collection, uh, where he had a, the uh, Parnham School of Woodwork, which is a very prestigious place. Um, he wanted a turning to wow them. That was the uh, commission. Um, and uh, this is the most difficult thing I could think of uh, to make. In fact, the box is the tricky bit while the sticks are just kind of tedious. Um, but the spillicans became a slow production item for me, and I've sold around 260 sets. Um, several have won awards and prizes, um, and at least a dozen are in public collections. Uh, but most have gone to people looking for something to stay in a family as an heirloom, which uh, I rather like. Um, these are African blackwood. So then I did uh, what might have seemed a very foolish thing. Um, in January 82, I moved to Australia, where I, in fact, had dozens of relations. I'd also lived in Sydney in the late 1940s, uh, and I worked there for three months uh, in 1977. Uh, it was certainly risky financially because I had a really good business in Britain, uh, where I was a well-known craft identity, um, and I was virtually unknown in Australia. Uh, but fortunately, I was able to return to Sturt workshops where I'd been a craftsman in residence uh, in 1977. And I set about making bowls uh, rather like these. Um, these are actually from that time um, that I knew would sell through the Sturt Gallery, which was uh, uh, quite a well-known outlet. And I needed more outlets than the Sturt Workshops Gallery. So I took a box of bowls, boxes and scoops to a couple of galleries in Sydney and another one in Canberra. And all three purchased what I had, uh, all three placed an order for more, and each one offered me a solo exhibition. Um, so I was extremely relieved to be up and running again in a new environment, and I got on with churning out bowls and boxes. Um, nobody was too interested in scoops, and uh, I was quite happy with that. So I turned a lot of hue and pine, which sells very easily in Australia, uh, but not as I eventually discovered anywhere else. Um, and for a few years, I was sourcing wood in Tasmania, which is where the hue and comes from. Uh, and every April, uh, I spent a week with a former student down there. And uh, we get a $5 craft license from the forestry department that allowed craft workers to go in and collect a, um, into virgin forest and collect a ton of timber. Only a ton at one time, they didn't check too much, so we tended to get two tons. Uh, we'd have a very nice day out in the virgin forest, uh, collecting figured waste discarded by commercial loggers, 
and then we cut a few small uncommercial logs. Uh, at the end of the week, I drive home with a few small logs uh, and half a ton of roughed out bowls. And then the bowls would dry, uh, would uh, dry it over winter. Um, and I'd complete them in October, November, uh, just as the Christmas and summer orders came in. And uh, in Australia, most of the work sells from Christmas through to Easter. So the little horizontal scrub bowls. And these are box elder, but I sold a lot of similar bowls um, in Tasmanian bowls, and they're all less than eight inch diameter. Um, but I never took any photographs of them for some reason. Then I discovered that Banks here, oops, and I have another drink. Then I discovered Banks here was ideal for turning green and uh, made quite a few of these bowls, which went very well. And for around three years, I turned a lot of smallish thin bowls, um, many with bark rims, which were a uh, bit of a novelty in those days. I experimented with a few faceted sides uh, because I felt the timbers were rather dull and needed something. Um, I really liked the five and seven sides, which were cut on the bandsaw, and I tended to leave the, the, the facets off the saw, uh, sanded a few. Um, but there was a lot which could go wrong, um, could get the facets way out of kilter, um, and I didn't make more than a few dozen. Also, I discovered Sally Wattle growing locally, which was uh, an, acacia, uh, an acacia, which uh, the local turners didn't seem to be using for some reason. Uh, it was mostly highly figured and uh, terrific stuff to work. Um, for the local turners, I think my arrival was a bit of a shock. Um, I like to think my bowls were a lot better than theirs, um, but they were also a lot cheaper, often half the price. I tried a few less practical forms like this uh, 15 by eight inch um, uh, casuarina bowl, uh, which I was very pleased with, uh, uh, but I've still got it. Uh, it went to a number of places and never sold at any price, tried at all kinds of prices. When I arrived in Australia, uh, I had with me a half finished manuscript for turning wood. Uh, so in between everything else, uh, including designing and building a house, um, I was writing a book. And in the end, I just sat down for three weeks and got it done. Um, and it was published three years later and led to a never ending demand for workshops uh, and a lot of magazine articles, uh, which I always quite enjoyed writing. Then from the mid eighties, um, big chunky red bowls dominated the Sydney market. And for a couple of years, these kind of 10 kilo monsters sold well, it's about 22 pounds. Um, and it was also a time of extravagant decoration. Uh, often there were far too many beads, um, there was occasional bit of restraint. Um, and then uh, there were some gross curves too. Most bowls like uh, this 13 by nine inch uh, xantheria or grass tree uh, had walls at least an inch thick. And uh, as I was turning, I'm always used to wonder if eventually uh, they'd be coming back and uh, for being uh, to be returned to something thinner and less pretentious. Uh, and quite a few have come back uh, and I've transformed them and you'll see one of them later. This one, uh, the stringy bark burl, split as it dried. Um, so I had it sandblasted. Uh, I always rather liked it, um, but it failed to sell, uh, went through several galleries, failed to sell. So for 35 years, uh, I used it to store onions and potatoes. Um, and then somebody remarked how nice it looked and uh, what a lovely bowl it was. Uh, so it now lives in Melbourne. It's got a very good home there. The real big game changer, I think, for wood turning was the introduction of the Nova Chuck in 1989. Um, it overwhelmed several of the chucking systems at the time, uh, including a raffin chuck. Um, 
and spawned numerous copies and variations. I've got a collection of Vicmark Chucks, uh, partly to support the Australian an Australian company, uh, but mostly because I reckon they're way superior to all the other Chucks uh, I've tried. Um, and that's mostly down to the way the jaw rims, uh, jaw rims are machined. So I found the, the uh, big mark jaws can grip teeny details without marking the wood, if you get the size right. Uh, unlike most jaws I've been supplied with for demos. Uh, and I can take a finished piece uh, straight out of the chuck. And I suppose I should point out that I have removed the jaw so you can see what's happening. Now, each of these bowls uh, was gripped roughly in line with the inside depth. As you can see, you can really grip on a very small detail. And whenever possible, uh, I try to turn a bowl on two fixings so that I can, I can take uh, finished pieces out of the chuck. Uh, rounded bases obviously need rechucking uh, over a jam chuck or possibly over chuck jaws. Um, but these chucks really made production turning a lot easier. And these, of course, came straight out of the chuck. Now, to meet the demand for red burl, um, I took to purchasing um, jarrah burls by the ton, and they would come over bark and all. Um, I found that four inch high bowls really sold for twice the price of a two inch high bowl, the same diameter. So I tended to cut bowls for platters rather than, uh, rather than bowls, thicker bowls. And I got a much better return on what was the increasingly expensive wood. Uh, the price of jarrow was forced up uh, initially by hobby turners in Australia, willing to pay a lot more for blanks than I could justify. Um, and then later by the uh, container loads going over to uh, Europe and to, the, and to uh, the US mostly. So I began using red gum, which is what you see here. Now, uh, through the 1990s, um, two galleries purchased 80% of what I made, which was almost exclusively reddish bowls. And this was a, a typical order. Um, rather irritatingly, this gallery decided to have my bowls made by another turner. Um, and uh, it was not really a financial catastrophe, just irritating. Uh, and I was then 60. And I didn't feel like hustling around looking for new galleries who'd probably want consignment anyway. Uh, and it simply meant that my considerable stock of rough red gum bowls would now all go out through Naturally Australian, which was a wonderful gallery in Sydney who always paid on delivery. Sadly, that wonderful outlet closed in about uh, 2010 after the global financial crisis and they had a rent increase or their rent was going to double. Um, but by then I was 67 and past the official retiring age and uh, suddenly I found myself free to make stuff without a specific market in mind that was really quite liberating. So I took to making, um, to turning uh, pin oak and claret ash, I was still making bowls, usually thinner bowls, uh, fully aware that these would be difficult to sell. Um, what I did sell was mostly through my local ACT Woodcraft Guild, um, who appeared occasionally at uh, craft markets, and we did the annual uh, National Folk Festival each Easter, which was in Canberra. And I considered, uh, continued to, to uh, sell smaller pieces at American symposiums and workshops. I had some really nice commissions, uh, which uh, were for larger bowls. Um, and I started leaving three stubby feet on the bottom of green turned uh, bowls, which I call tripod bowls. Uh, and the feet really are all that remains of the original chucking tenon. I just wish I... <coughs> I just wish I'd thought about this kind of 40 years earlier. I could have taken some smaller logs to market in half the time. 
I'm beginning to splutter here. These um, Bozana's fruit bowls uh, are also tripod bowls, turn green. Uh, these are two of the largest or two of the four largest bowls I've ever made. I did once make a 27 by three inch U platter. Um, and that was such a sobering experience. I never wanted to do, go near there again. I've also done a few heavy forms. which always find a real challenge to get balanced. Uh, get the look right and the feel right. I've done a lot of plates, sets of plates, and I uh, really like the square ones, and I've done breakfast sets, quite a few of those. And I've enjoyed playing around uh, for a short while with coloured waxes, um, although I did find on a hot uh, day once in Utah that they melted when it gets over 90 degrees. So that wasn't so good. Um, but I did a collection of around 60 bowls uh, for an exhibition. Um, they didn't sell then and they've sold very, very slowly since. Um, I still have some. Then I discovered uh, Verdigris, which is a faux finish, and combined that with gold acrylic. Um, but I soon dropped that uh, in favor of bright colors. Um, and I never sand any of these bowls uh, when they're going to get the verdigris or acrylic, um, but the pieces are dried uh, so they uh, distort in a microwave before the finish goes on. Um, if there are any splits, they get filled with epoxy um, unless they're big enough to be some kind of a feature. Um, these pots uh, need to be turned quickly uh, because the wood's being um, wood's green, uh, and that tends to bring a bit of extra life, I find, to the forms. Um, it's always the case if you labour for hours over a form, it does tend to look laboured over. The verdigris um, and rust, um, which I discovered after the verdigris, uh, don't get any sort of sealer or varnish on top. Uh, one, because it flattens the, uh, the surface, creates a different uh, look altogether, um, but mostly because they carry on gently rusting or going green. Um, somebody wanted to know if they were utilitarian the other day, uh, but they are definitely purely decorative and non-utilitarian. I ebonize a lot of enclosed forms uh, using the rusty nails and vinegar mix. Uh, so I can refer to them as ancient pots. Um, these again look better for being turned green, so there's a bit of surface collapse as they dry out. Um, they're generally sanded uh, to about 360 uh, and sanded whilst green. As you'll have noted from my enclosed forms, um, I tend to call them pots, um, which are turned green, they're all turned green. Uh, I prefer the timber to be three to four months felled because there's still enough moisture in the wood to get the distortions it dries out, but it's dry enough uh, that I can sand the wood with reasonable ease. As with my bowls, I want these to feel good when I pick them up, um, as well as I uh, want them looking okay, obviously. Um, these are not ultra light in weight. So as with the bowls, the last thing I want is a thin and even wall, uh, like the bottom one uh, on the bottom right corner there. When that was handled, that pot didn't feel half as good as the two above. And I think there's, there's a bit of preoccupation, I find, especially in the States, uh, with the even wall thinness. Now, boxes, uh, which I've kept as a kind of separate batch. Um, I'm well known for boxes, but I've probably made fewer than uh, 3,500. Um, boxes are pretty difficult to market in a retail situation. Um, like jewelry, they're things which really need to be demonstrated and handled. Um, and then they've got to be displayed securely. So for most craft galleries, they're actually a bit of a nuisance. Um, I sold a few dozen of the very large store pots uh, at the rear to um, one souvenir shop in Cornwall uh, in the early 70s. Um, 
and I sold two to the British Crafts Council for their tea bags and sugar in their London office. Um, and the smaller bowls like those in front sold mostly for ring boxes through dedicated crafts galleries that uh, specialized in jewelry. Most of my boxes have been hand grain uh, with suction fit lids. And the flanges are always at least half an inch long uh, because that way I get a better and easier to make suction fit. I was very pleased uh, with these uh, little rounded boxes until I discovered that globes are extremely difficult to open if the lid jams. It's difficult to get a secure grip on the curves. And if you squeeze too hard near the rim, then uh, near the join, uh, you just tighten the lid. Now, my initial solution was to have a groove on the join into which you could slip a sharp blade or so you could prise the lid off. Um, then I went for cylinders with domes, rather like those ones to the, to the right. This is the only photo I've got from of boxes in the mid 70s. Um, they still had suction bit lids and, and finials. And then uh, the time came when I couldn't get liability insurance for my American orders uh, because of the finials. So I just stopped making finials and went for plain domes. Uh, until I made this Hue and Pine group, and then I started going more for the kind of uh, Italian, they're always seen as kind of uh, Russian-type domes, I suppose. Around that time also, I sold a few dozen uh, two-inch cube versions of the sculpted ring box to the left. Um, they were time-consuming and, and quite easy to get wrong, um, so I went back to my usual ring boxes. Uh, the problem with these really was that the, uh, the shoulders first have to be dead flat in order to get a satisfactory join, and then all kinds of things could go wrong as you kind of shake the outside. When I got to Australia, my Sydney galleries um, wanted groups of near identical boxes, uh, mostly catering for Japanese tourists who like to buy several of a very similar item uh, when they were buying gifts for groups of people. Um, I've made quite a few of these large hue and pine boxes um, and uh, quite enjoyed those because the hue and stable and uh, they look pretty good. Uh, and then suddenly the market went dead flat. But fortunately, by that time, I was uh, doing symposiums in the States and workshops and uh, most of the boxes I've sold since the mid 80s or the early 80s have been sold uh, at American symposiums. Now, I soon discovered that in the States, you guys will buy dark boxes almost instantly and will all but ignore the pale ones, unless there's no Coca Cola or other exotic in sight. So I soon learned to display one or the other. Um, this effort to be artistically creative was for uh, Terry Martin's Wood Dreaming exhibition, which was touring Australia. Um, they're not the sort of work I want to be remembered by, but somebody liked them enough to steal them, uh, which was wonderful because I got all the insurance, whereas if they'd been sold, I would have only got 50%. Um, so I can really recommend having your work stolen from an exhibition. These boxes uh, with threaded lids were made for the SOFA exhibition, the Sculpture Objects Functional Art Exhibition uh, in Chicago, a very big event annually. I assume it still goes. Um, and I made these Citadel boxes as well. Uh, and I made these thinking to wind up the gallery owner taking my work to SOFA. Um, I was sure she'd hate them, uh, but she didn't. She wanted 50. Um, or thereabouts, so she could assemble them into groups of three to five. Uh, unfortunately, we had to ship the whole lot back to Australia, um, where they sold in Sydney, uh, mostly to American tourists. Um, over 25 years, I've sold maybe 250, um, and quite a few have been used as funerary urns. Uh, 
I make the citadel boxes from timber, which is too full of defects for bowls or end grain boxes. Uh, and the decoration is fast and loose and done with a handheld Dremel uh, with a cylindrical cutter, a little kind of barrel thing. Um, then the whole lot is charred or with a gas torch, propane torch, uh, and then brushed back very aggressively with a wire brush. The idea is uh, to get a battered ancient uh, kind of war-torn look, and they were inspired by uh, the Cathar uh, castles I saw on tops of hills in the south of France. And I wrote this box up as a project for Australian Wood Review. Um, this is charred red gum. Uh, it was buffed uh, finally with a brass kind of daisy wheel. Uh, and left unoiled, somehow managed to resist putting uh, some sort of lacquer on it. Um, now, I rather wish I'd kept this and also these. Um, but the problem is if you're in business, uh, you get the best prices for the better pieces. Um, so they got sold. And finally for boxes, uh, these are silo boxes, which I made for the Waves of Grain exhibition at the uh, uh, AAW Symposium in 2017 in Kansas City. Um, I forgot to measure them, but I think they're around uh, three inches diameter. And I think it's silver acrylic um, color, but I really can't remember. Now, other stuff. From time to time, uh, I did branch out. Uh, for six years, I made salt and knife boxes for David Miller's kitchen shops, uh, mostly because there were such good customers they asked me to. I always find it a bit of a chore. Um, these are, this is one in my sister's kitchen, um, and this was uh, one in Don White, who's an uh, English turner, no longer with us, unfortunately, but uh, he was using that for wax at his workshop. About 1979, I was approached by Dave Bowkett uh, to make bases for his birds. Um, instead of saying no, I quoted a ridiculously high price of uh, just over a pound, um, thinking to put him off, and it was kind of $3 at the most. Um, he said yes. Um, I didn't know that his birds sold for 250 pounds, um, but... Uh, it was very, very good money. Um, I could make as much in a day as I normally was in a week at that stage. Um, it was an order I was very sorry to leave behind when I emigrated, uh, and it was an order my brother was delighted to take on. I did once turn a set of goblets for a family in the Channel Islands uh, who commissioned these for their breakfast milk. Um, as commissioned, they had no finish. Um, they came back to me via a dealer in Northern Ireland um, in very good condition that had clearly been well used. And I did make some other goblets for my Turning Toys book. I enjoyed doing these. Um, and they went down very well with a couple of young wizards casting Potter-like spells. They're about uh, eight inches high. And here are some more... Uh, Toys I did for the Turning Toys book, and I think there's a, there's a car on the Turning Toys video too. There was a flurry of ladles, um, but I was too busy really with other orders to, puse, uh, to peruse these as a production line. Um, I look at them now and I'm assuming they were mostly turned, but I really can't remember. Uh, there had to be some uh, and work and probably carving them on a, um, a sander of some sort. In the years 2017 to 20, uh, every couple of months I made batches of 50 flag bases. Um, it took me a whole day to design and make the jig to drill the holes accurately. Um, and the holes had to be dead accurate. Um, so the flags were exactly the same angle and height. Um, to prevent international incidents, I suppose. Um, and alongside those, I turned batches of finials to go on top of eight foot flagpoles. And it was the kind of thing I think professional turners need to do to keep the cash flowing. Eventually I passed the job on to someone who was a bit hungrier than me. 
demonstrating the National Folk Festival each year. In recent years, I've done dozens of tippers, um, many bespoke for players of the Irish bodhram, that's the Irish drum. And some of them were, were very thin and really quite difficult to make, but uh, what people wanted. And every August for about 15 years, I've made a dozen trophy bases to go under a bottle. Um, and that is uh, quite the best job I have. I, I make an indecent amount in one hour um, and she plays on the spot. I've also done several presentation platters and bowls for the National Youth University uh, Nuclear Physics Department. Um, the one on the right uh, was a return of the thick Xantheria 80s bowl, uh, you might remember, with the gross curves. So that now has a little medallion in the bottom. And sub jobs, jobs uh, I do wonder how I take on. Uh, this was a prototype of a uh, set of pieces for a new game. Um, the recess in the top had to be exactly one millimeter deep. So the disc which went in it sat flush with the rim. Um, eight pieces had to be five millimeters higher than the others. And the client was pretty picky about the exact shape and diameter of each piece. And I felt I really earned my $800 for that one. Um, and then he wanted another set, uh, which he actually got. And final for oddities and tricky jobs, um, the American Embassy in Canberra wanted these medallions visible from both sides in the base of a bowl. Uh, and the wood is from uh, a pin oak planted in 1943 by Eleanor Roosevelt, um, which had blown over in a freak storm in around 2014. Uh, I'd already turned several wavy bowls for the embassy uh, when this wood was still green, uh, but I'm not looking forward to doing any more of these medallions. Uh, they were a very tricky job because there wasn't much space to stick them in and they're held in there with hot glue. Now, workshops and demos. Um, I've always kind of enjoyed passing on what I know and uh, I'm told I'm quite good at it, um, despite my lack of formal training. Um, this fellow certainly seemed to be enjoying learning how to cut beads. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of complaints about the lack of personal protection, but there we are. He had a good time. Um, I could have made a good living just teaching, um, but turning was always uh, my main business. Uh, and workshop tours um, really provided a welcome break from production. Um, but it did mean uh, everything had to be kind of netted together, the production and the tours and the teaching and so on, uh, as did my writing books and articles, which uh, the books and articles generally got done in the evenings. Anyway, for 33 years, from about 1983 to 2016, I did at least one six week workshop tour a year, mostly in the States uh, and occasionally two. Um, they were very lucrative, um, so I used to sell quite a bit of work as well as getting a fee for teaching. Um, but they were mostly very hard work, uh, and it was unrelenting wood turning most of the time. Um, and the days not teaching were usually spent traveling on to the next gig. And then when I got home, I had galleries desperate for more bowls and uh, so I would get stuck into that and uh, life rolled on without too many formal holidays, but um, I was never complaining, I was enjoying life. Demos in the early 80s typically involved small groups crowding around the lathes, um, very similar to this. Um, and then we went through a period where you'd stand in front of a crowd with a mirror over the top and some people had quite a good view. Um, and then as more and more people took up turning wood, um, they got seats. And after a few years, we even had video, which made demonstrating a lot more informative. Uh, but you can imagine watching a demo like this um, with no video, uh, it was entirely up to the demonstrator to explain what was going on. 
um, when demonstrating, I aim to, uh, to uh, kind of articulate everything which is going through my mind pertaining to the job on the lathe. So I aim to give you a running commentary on what I'm doing and why, uh, even if it's just looking for a pencil on the bench. Um, I think it's very important to keep you informed at all times. I've watched too many demos where I've wondered what on earth the guy is doing on the bench and comes back maybe a minute later and, you know, and gets on with whatever it is. Also, I don't think a symposium demo should be a tool demonstration. Um, if you've got a tool to sell and they're using it, uh, its worth should be so self-evident that people ask you about it afterwards, then you can kind of go through your spiel. In hands-on workshops, I concentrate on refining techniques through turning uh, basically simple bowls, boxes, mallets and scoops. Um, and then I let people loose on their own projects uh, uh, as I look over their shoulders and help when any problem comes along. Um, I always aim to ease people out of their uh, kind of comfort zone, um, but I still wanted them to have a good time and go away feeling they'd learnt something and achieved something. Uh, I always reckoned I could vary the difficulty of any project to suit uh, each student. Now, just a few words about exhibitions, uh, about which I'm distinctly ambivalent, despite having had work in... Uh, I think something over 160 solo and uh, major shows. Uh, I've always set aside what I consider my very best, uh, and I keep those pieces for direct sales uh, to collectors and other people, um, and for exhibitions. You know, solar exhibitions are really good for your ego, at least at first, um, but the reality is uh, for a professional, <coughs> is that exhibits, exhibits have to be ready a month or more ahead of the opening. Uh, there's absolutely no guarantee of sales. <clears throat> and even if there are sales, really do you get a check uh, within a month of the exhibition closing. Whereas with wholesaling, uh, and what makes it so appealing is that you get paid within a month of delivery, uh, and it usually means you're being paid within a month of the piece being made a month or six weeks of the piece being made. Major exhibitions in which you have only one or two pieces are a kind of different matter. Um, there's really much effort required um, uh, because uh, I usually have something suitable and all I have to do is pack it up and send it off. Um, this group was part of an exhibition that toured American museums for three years. Um, so I suppose that was good for my kind of overall image. Um, they were for sale all that time, but eventually came back to me uh, and I sold them at an American Symposium. Uh, then in 1973, uh, I had two pieces in the Craftsman's Art Exhibition that launched the British Crafts Council. Uh, it really was a major craft event um, and it was a major event in my wood turning career. Uh, it was the London's uh, Victorian Albert Museum, and it showed off the creme de la creme of British crafts. They'd picked 470 objects from about 28,000 or so submitted, and I was the only turn in the exhibition with a 16-inch U platter, very similar to this, um, alongside a ripple ash salad bowl consisting of six, uh, sorry, salad set, uh, consisting of six, uh, six by three bowls surrounding a 14 by three. And it was beautiful rippled ash, I remember. Um, they were very traditional, unlike most stuff in the show. Now, following this, I was asked to go on the new British Crafts Council slide index. Uh, and then more to my surprise, asked to sit on the slide selection panel, which was really accepting people into the organization. Um, I was on that for seven years, uh, and we met every month. Uh, it was terrific for networking, and I learned a huge amount about assessing other crafts. Now, until I moved to Australia, um, I reckon there was really a, barely, a, um, really a month, really, when I didn't have something 
in a major craft exhibition somewhere in Britain or Europe. It did me very well, that exhibition. In recent years, uh, I've tended to show only work um, that I wouldn't expect my usual outfits, uh, outlets to buy outright. Um, and these tubes are good examples. The first time I showed tubes um, uh, in an exhibition, only one pair sold to a kindly friend, and that was that. Uh, but despite that inauspicious start, I've made several hundred. Uh, I've no idea where most of them have ended up, only that fewer than 30 would have sold through a gallery or an exhibition. The bare degree tubes um, have done me very well, uh, making uh, at least three back covers or front covers on magazines. And some of these little tubes got pretty wild. Um, and these were in, a, in an exhibition in Darwin. Um, I was particularly fond of these. Uh, they didn't sell at the, at the exhibition, um, but they were snapped up a year later when I took them uh, to Olympia in Washington where we were doing workshops. Uh, as an image was filled, something like this could be, now look here. Um, but I hope that their keepers will keep arranging uh, these three pieces to uh, kind of create different moods. Uh, to finish, um, here are a couple of my favorite bowls of recent years, uh, both turned green. Uh, this was in the Darwin exhibition. Um, it was sold before it got to the exhibition. Somebody bought it uh, when they shouldn't have done just before the opening. Um, and finally, this is a tripod bowl, uh, which I made as a demo on the 2013 Norwegian wood turning cruise, uh, which if you haven't signed up for it, I suspect there might still be some places available. Terrific experience. Um, I've used this bowl almost every day since for salad bowls, uh, hot pasta, soups, I even had out of it once, um, curries, uh, it's just a very useful general food bowl. And that is the end of the slides. Thank you so, so, so very much. How much did I run over time? <laughs> oh, that's only just over an hour, which is uh, right. gives us plenty of time to what we were aiming for talk yeah. and do more questions from Mike Porter. I'm enjoying your new YouTube channel. After all the videos you've made over the years, what motivated you to do these very helpful videos? Rather, rather, I didn't think it through. I, I did them in order to spruik the videos and the books. So um, why I thought anybody would buy a video when I'm putting out a good video on the YouTube channel, I have no idea, but anyway. Um, uh, that was it, and I would. Um, and I kind of, I kind of fell into it because uh, a fellow had recorded a video um, uh, with my local wood group, and the the battery had run out in the camera, so we re-recorded. And uh, Dave suggested I get it, put it up on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, then I discovered I'd had a YouTube channel for nine years. Um, I have no recollection of doing that, but anyway. Um, and that's how it happened. And uh, he then moved away. Uh, he's moved further north. And um, so I learned to do it myself. And they're all, they're all shot on, uh, on this little iPhone 6 here. And uh, that's it. And I'm still sorting out the little problems, one of which seems to be sound, which I'm talking with Doug about at the moment. All right, from David Burgess. What one thing, a skill or tool, has had the greatest impact in progressing your turning career? Oh, one to, well, it would have to be Vic Mark Chucks, I would think. They made a huge difference to getting wood on and off the lathe and holding it uh, quickly. And especially with those, um, when I can grip small details, it just makes making the little bowls so quick and easy to do. From Steve Mallinson, would uh, he would like your opinions on negative rake scrapers? I was prepared for this one. You are you 
trued me up the other days. I think they're a complete waste of a good tool, uh, generally, um, especially on the in, on the inside of a um, uh, if you're trying to turn a cylinder. Uh, and it's for this reason. Now, what I've got is a little uh, a little cylinder. Now, if you um, I use a, a tool um, which has a generally about a 45 degree bevel. And if I'm cutting in, so you say on a box flange, when I cut, you can see where the, uh, the, uh, the only bit in contact with the wood is the top left edge. But if I have a negative rake scraper there, when I come in through, where's the edge? It's inside, it's kept in from by the two sides. And that means as you cut in, uh, it's like a taper cutting jig. The tool just slides in towards center. And that I think is where, they're, um, where they don't do much good. Um, if you want a negative rake on anything, I mean, negative rake is the angle between the surface you're cutting and, and, uh, and the top of the tool. So normally you'd have the tool tilted down very slightly. So all you have to do is raise the handle and that will tilt the tool down. If, you, if you've got the negative rake, then you've got to tilt, drop the handle an awfully long way to have a catch, uh, but it's still possible. But generally I, I, I find this, I've had several people in workshops, um, I had one guy in Britain I remember who said, uh, oh no, this is something you can only do with a negative rate scraper, um, which was some kind of open lattice vase. It was all long grain. And I went straight round it with my big scraper and it was clean as a whistle, you know, so uh, he wasn't very impressed. Um, <laughs> but I discovered later he was one of the British gurus on negative rate scrapers. So, you know, I, I think they're a bit of a furphy, really. Okay. But it's um, almost difficult to buy a standard scraper now. <laughs> so anyway. But I'm Gary, working on it. <laughs> okay. From Gary Borders. Have you used any ancillary tools such as CNC routers or laser engravers to enhance your work? Uh, no, is the short word. No, no. I mean, the, the nearest I get was the um, would be the Dremel, um, which um, a lot of people don't regard that as particularly enhancing. But um, the um, uh, but no, that would be about it. But I've. Uh, I think if I was a, um, if I was still in full production, I, I'd probably get a, a laser for putting my name in, if nothing else. I don't know. It's, um, you know, when you're in production, you've got a kind of totally different mindset to these things. So um, I think one of the worst things we ever did was signing our names on the bottom of bowls, because uh, in the early days, um, they used to do the outsides of, should we say six by three inch bowls, and I'd line them up on the bench, half done, and with a punch, I'd just bang my name in. I had a punch, uh, bang, 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 and they're all signed. Um, and then I'd hollow them out. Uh, whereas with the, if you, you can't do that on a thin bowl; you go through the bottom. Um, so, uh, and I found that branding. If I branded it, uh, people seemed to think it was mass produced, which in a way it was, but. Um, and uh, and so uh, we got to the stage where people really expected a signature on the bottom of the bowl and then the wood. Um, and it, I mean, we used to take anything up to an hour a day signing the bottom of the bowls mm -hmm. sometimes. So yeah, it's got very tedious, but uh, I've done a bit of poker work and stuff. I tried that once. I remember it's, I was demonstrating a potter's camp and I was branding designs around a bowl and a couple of the really well-known internationally known potters walked past who I knew and, and I read David Leach saying uh, your bowls really don't need that sort of thing <laughs> and uh, if a god of pottery says something like that I kind of tend to take it on board. Okay from Glenn Simpson thank you for sharing your experience and expertise I have your book and I'm a rank amateur beginner. How would you suggest using the book for learning uh, how to turn? Well, depends which book he's got. There are kind of at least, I mean, there are four basic books out there, but you'd, um, 
generally the, the I mean the, the back the, the exercises are there really to kind of work through and you know just work through them and you'll you'll learn I think I mean if you're a complete beginner I'd start off with doing the beads and curves between centers um it's usually the kind of best best way to come to terms with the um with the tools and I've just put up a video on um uh, when you first go on a lathe about roughing down a square blank uh, square blank to round um and so I'll probably be doing a few more I suppose for kind of real newbies like that but um they're um I think basically you've just got to make simple stuff and experiment and practice yeah. Uh, but using the book as such, um, I suppose if it's turning wood, you just read it through and and follow along. Um, and I can't, I haven't looked at the books for some years, so I can't quite remember what's in them in the right order. <laughs> so. uh, Dale Larson has a uh, remark. I still use your Jara bowl, Earl Bowl in my kitchen every day. I bought it when you came to teach at Cascade in 1993. It was turned in one step wet and has a wonderful feel from the burl pattern. Yes, I remember that bowl. It was a particularly good one. He yeah. probably paid a lot more than I would sell it to him for now. So <laughs> if indeed I would sell it. <laughs> no, Richard, I paid $175 for it. Well, that was a pretty good price in 1993. So. Right. It was, it was, for me, it was uh, the first piece of turned art I ever bought. And it kind of broke a, a barrier in my mind. And so that's why I've always appreciated it, was that it, it allowed me to buy wood art. Good. Well, I hate to think that it's art, but it's, it was a very good bowl. So uh, <laughs> that's good. Good. Uh, From Lynn Otto. As a wood turning artist, what have you been the most challenging times for you? Uh, such as, have there been any times you thought you'd have to quit full time wood art or get a regular job and only work with wood as a hobby? What brought you through those times? Right, well, the first one um, was Australia in 1987 had a pilot strike. And there were almost no internal flights for six months, um, which meant there was no tourism to speak of. And um, the turning turnover, as far as I can remember, dropped about uh, 60%. Um, and uh, I was very glad that year I, you could get international flights um, and I was able to teach workshops. And that's what saved me that time. Um, what other ones did we have? Um, we had, well, the introduction of GST in 1973 in Britain. Um, and around that time, there was a three day working week too, uh, where you work like mad for three days and then you weren't allowed to do anything for the rest of the week. Um, but interestingly at that time, production actually went up in the country because for the first time people actually did a full day's work rather than sitting around the water cooler or whatever. Um, so that got me through that lot. Uh, the other nasty ones were, I've had a couple of times where, um, where my work was just dropped. Um, first time happened with Sturt Gallery where I was selling a lot and the new manager came in whose wife made ceramics, did ceramics. And uh, uh, the wood was just cut out in favor of her big bowls. And uh, that, that was costing me, it probably cost me 10 or 12,000 a year. Um, but it, it picked up elsewhere fairly easily. So mostly I've, I've had more work than I could really take on. So, uh, so I always had galleries lined up to whom I could go um, if things got, if things dropped out in one place. And then, uh, yeah. All right. From Glenn Nord, where can we get some of your projects to buy? Mine, me. That's I'm the only one. <laughs> so you just come through my website, and uh, I ship stuff off fairly regularly. Um, 
uh, whereas I've sent stuff to Brazil, um, Brazil, Croatia, England, Germany, um, and to the States, and uh, some to Canada, some to Alaska. So, no, it's and generally the for the small stuff, it costs the mail is around twenty to thirty dollars. So. Mm -hmm. um, but it's mounting up. I don't have an outlet here. So, I mean, we really don't have any craft galleries to sell to in Australia at the moment. So. Yeah. From Chris Dix, how do you best activate your creative juices? And what are some of the significant aha moments in your wood turning career? What do you think inspired them? Well, what activates them generally is a fear of no income. Um, so that's, uh, uh, you know, you, it really kind of keeps you going. Uh, and I think with, I can't think of any real kind of aha moments, but um, I, I tend to make, I would be doing runs of things. So I'd cut a load of blanks. So, I mean, generally I, when I, in production in Britain, I was making run, definite runs of things. And uh, if you suddenly got a blemish you weren't, or something you weren't expecting in a block of wood, that sends you off in a different direction. So you might be taking away a knot, um, which suddenly means, and I always take away all the wood I don't want in a blank and then see what I can do with what's left. So with, um, uh, and that's how some of the kind of footed bowls uh, occur with a with a, a big pull foot. So I've got that. What can I do with what's left? So, uh, and then if I find something which uh, looks interesting, then I would pursue that run for a while. And that was one of the advantages of I mean, having inadvertently established uh, a market for one-off bowls. I could cope with that. I had a market to sell them, um, and particularly towards. The end of the seventies, when the thin bowls there was demand for thin bowls, that was really good. Um, I was just thinking another kind of hiccup. In fact, going back to the previous question, um, in the early eighties, in uh, uh, in in Sydney, where I was selling most stuff, when I first arrived, you you couldn't sell anything other than a thin plain bowl. Nobody was interested in in burl. Um, and then suddenly nobody wanted to buy a thin bowl. And I can remember 30 coming back from my main outlet in Sydney. Uh, and they swapped those over for, um, uh, for the big heavy Jarra ones. And uh, that suddenly, uh, suddenly that's what we were making. And, and that was it. It was very much easier money in many ways. Uh, but the thin bowls took a long time to sell. From Mark Clark, how did you get started with your own uh, setup? And uh, also, how would you, what would you recommend to new turners that want to get lathe or set up their shop? What should they look at? Oh, well, so much depends on budget um, and what you want to do. I mean, you, you need to have a vague idea, I think, of, of what you want to make. Um, and then you'd spend this as much as you can afford really on a on a really good lathe um and the tools and you've got chucks and uh i mean really it's probably pays to join a local club if you've got one uh close by and so you can uh, then get advice from people there um but i think when you when you're just setting up um when I made the mistake when I started getting the coronet lathe, which really was, as far as I remember, was against the advice I had at the time. And they said, get a bigger one. I really wanted to buy a fell lathe, which they're no longer made, but they were magnificent pattern makers machines. But I can remember it was, uh, and they were, um, it was like driving a car. It had an actual gearbox and they had four speeds. Uh, but they were 1,200 pounds and I bought my first graduate for 109. Um, and so that were, you know, the, the big lathes were 10 times the price. Um, but the, uh, so I, I would buy, you know, in the States now, you'd probably be looking at uh, Powermatic or Robust. And uh, the Gunas are pretty good, I think. You know, you've got so much choice now. Uh, Vic Marks are always excellent. So. 
you just buy as good as you can afford um, and justify it. And you'll never lose money on them, or you shouldn't ever lose money on them. Interesting. You said the one lathe had a gearbox, like a stick shift on a car? For yep. speed? Yeah, they were made in the 30s, in the 1930s. And wow. uh, it had a big, heavy, up on the on top of the motor. It was direct drive. The spindle went right through the electric motor. Um, and you, not unlike the Techno tool, uh, more than the, the Nova tools. Um, and and you drove. You had four four forward and one reverse. Wow. It, it was. <laughs> it was. They were, they were wonderful, wonderful things, you know. I and mean, we're better off now with the variable speed, you know, but at the time that was terrific, you know. Um, and that was one which was, I mean, it was 1970, uh, that one was going, and it was one of 20 which had been in the Dartington, um, Dartington Cabinet Works in the 30s, early 30s. Uh, do you core your uh, blanks into multiple bowls? Uh, I used to, but uh, I, when I downsized, I sold all that stuff. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I used to. I use the McNaughton system, but I think, um, uh, and if you want to know how to use that, look at Mike Mahoney. Um, but but certainly, uh, Glenn Lucas, I think, uses the one-way system, or there's the woodcut, and you you probably go for those for continuity of. Uh, Product, you know, it's um, yeah, but it's certainly a good way to go. We spent years trying to find a way of doing that, uh, and uh, they've got it all taped now. All right, um, for your regular wood bowls, what finish do you use most on them? I, I put board linseed and uh, beeswax on everything, um, and uh, it's it's a finish which um. It is food safe when it's dried, as I understand. My understanding is there is no such thing as a non-toxic, as an, uh, I mean, all, all finishes are food safe once they've cured. Um, but uh, what I'm putting on uh, comes off fairly easily when it's washed up. Um, and uh, you end up with a, with a kind of flatter looking bowl. I got some here actually to, um, so you, you end up with, uh, and this is a maple bowl which comes from um, uh, which I would have made in about 1983, um, which we use day to day, and it was pretty flashy when it first came up. But I think it looks very nice now, kind of matte. Uh, I've got a a piece of 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 uh, very nice uh, has, uh, blackwood. This is a Sally Wattle. Um, which I think most people would be appalled to think that it was going to be used because it was very flashy bowl to look at. But I use this, eat cereal out of this quite often. It's just nice coming across the pattern at the bottom. Um, and the very last bowl I showed was this one, which is the, the one I made on the wood turning cruise. Um, it's got its three little feet on the bottom. You can barely see. Um, so that's That'll be used later on today for salad. It's always, it's always in use, that one. And so that's where I'm going with that. And then if I want for the, uh, looking for something a bit better made, um, then something like this would have had this little rosewood of some sort from the, uh, from the uh, early 80s. Um, that hasn't had any thing other than beeswax on it. It would have been finished probably with 180 grit at the time. And uh, that looks kind of pretty good. Wonderful. So that's where I go with that. I just hope that when people get stuff, um, they polish it. And I don't know if you might remember the, the box where there was the squarish box, a sculpted box with a little one alongside. Um, Don White, who owned those, uh, who was a turner in Britain, um, obviously polished those a lot often. Um, and they, they had that very nice patina, which you only get with polishing. You, you can't get it out of a bottle. So that's where I'm coming from on that. On your green turn bowls, how thick do you turn the walls to get that nice wave? Is there a particular 
thickness that you or thinness that you don't want to get to? Um, I find you don't really want to get them too thin, probably about um, somewhere around probably. Uh, We'll have to measure it to see, see what I've got. Um, I think the 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 last one uh, is it's uh, three sixteenths to a quarter, so it's probably three sixteenths down halfway around the curve, uh, and that seems to be about right. And I find with some of the heavier ones, um, a little bit thicker, especially with the bowl, you get a better collapse. With the slightly thicker bowl rather than the ultra thin. Never quite worked out why that happens, but uh, because I'm after that kind of nice feel, which is almost like a an orange, you know, which is uh, surface of an orange. All right, I'm going to unpin you so people can come up. Let's open this up to people who want to ask their own questions. Uh, unmute yourself. Uh, tell us your name and give us your question. My name is Gerald Stutz, and I have a question about platters. One of the items in your design book and in today's presentation, you section bowls to show the profiles and relationships and comment yeah. on that well i've gone looking for someone who has done that for platters and i've not been able to find it including me <laughs> um uh actually i have but they're uh, they're out in the workshop um but the chief reason i don't do it um i can show you the bottom of a platter this is a tray mm -hmm. um cedar tray uh, same kind of finish. Now that's got a recess of, I think it's two millimeters. Um, I can't measure it. I need a steel rule, but it's it's well less than quarter than an eighth of an inch, um, and uh, and so that's that. So when I'm doing the bottom, um, I I want to keep as much as I can in the middle, uh, because otherwise um, it. it the noise is horrendous when you're turning very thin across the middle. And that, the, the whole thing would only be an inch. It was an inch board. So uh, the bottom is still probably kind of quarter of an inch thick, something like that. Um, does that show what you were hoping to see roughly? Yes, it's, it's you compared profiles where you can see the relationship between the interior and the exterior. Yes. And and it's very hard to see both at the same time unless it is sectioned. And yeah. then your comments on why you feel uh, more attracted to one versus another is valuable to myself and right. I expect many others. Well, with this, I mean, design-wise on this platter, um, the main thing is, and there's one on the online, uh, on the YouTube thing, um, I've got a curve here so I can get my fingers underneath it. Um, and on a thin piece like that, I mean, the, you know, there's not much room to get fingers underneath. Um, and then the top, basically, uh, the flat bit here comes out as far as I dare. So uh, it's it's actually pretty much on line with the uh, with the rim of the foot, um, because you you have to have a little bit of strength in here, otherwise, if it's too thin. Um, I've I've seen very thin platters break just with the uh, uh, with the stress on the straight grain there. So um, and that's it. I think mostly what people don't have faith in is the chucks. Um, I mean the big marks are particularly good with their um, dovetail jaws, but uh, I think um, one way used to do a wide set of dovetails, and uh, I think Nova do one as well. But the wider I can grip that, really, the narrower the um, uh, or the, uh, the, the the thinner the rebate can be. Um, and I always just have the groove there so that um, the jaws can work in that, and there's still the weight in the middle. And you have to be careful not to get these grooves too low, otherwise you'll end up with a mirror frame. <laughs> Thank you. 
it was very interesting to me to see your early tools that you used and, and the, your comments about those is I think it's interesting for us to see the history and the evolution. And right now we're kind of evolving in the tools that are being used. And I personally like the more traditional profile tools and do you have any comments that you like to make on the tool steals that are being brought to market? I really can't tell the difference um, in use between uh, what are there there are twenty twenties and twenty forties and um, and we've had the um, sorry my memory is going to be slipping now or my short term memory. Um, the sintered steels, I mean, way the best steel I ever had um, was a sintered steel called um, uh, Vascoware, which uh, Jerry Glazer used to give me tools to try out. And he gave me a, a Stocksdale gouge, which is a half inch gouge. It was a different kind of pale gray to anything else I've ever seen. And I used that all through the 80s to rough out bowls. It just held an edge forever. It's extraordinary. Um, and I've never had anything remotely near that. Um, most of the modern steels, I really can't tell the difference uh, when they're in action. Um, but I think it's generally reckoned that the normal kind of high speed, uh, which would be the M2, uh, you can get a, a keener edge on it uh, for doing finer cuts. And then you've got the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the other one. Um, uh, the heat treated, well, I think it's heat treated, um, which, uh, but I have, there is a Raffin range making, made in this stuff. Um, but uh, that used to uh, kind of hold an edge for a bit longer, but not a, not one uh, kind of ultra sharp. And I think that's really the difference. Um, I think there are people who rough out a lot of bowls with one steel and then go to the, the, high, the HSS, the, uh, the M2 to do the finishing cuts. Uh, but broadly, I don't, I don't see too much difference. Um, um, the, uh, the older tools, I and mean, we didn't, I use those, uh, those Sorby guards, in fact, came, uh, uh, I had a student who had a complete set unused uh, of Sorby tools from the early 70s. Um, and I reground those for him and put, uh, took the wing off, uh, which is um, what I did with the tools originally. Um, and uh, that, as far as I know, is the start of the sweat back bowl uh, gouge, uh, because before then everybody used straight ground. And the straight ground probably does take stuff away faster. Um, or the certainly, the yes, the straight edge does take all stuff away faster. Uh, but I kept catching the inside wing, so I took it away. And then I discovered that the inside wing uh, or the left wing, a, uh, a convex uh, curved left wing, removed a heck of a lot of timber very quickly when you're profiling a bowl the outside. And so I extended that a little bit. And, uh, and I, I remember in Britain showing that to Dave Register, Ray Key, and uh, eventually McAtonnell, uh, Lem Flynn. And then uh, Ray Key and I showed uh, the Americans when we got to a symposium in Philadelphia in 1981. Um, but I think uh, but when we went to Philadelphia in 81, only Dell Stubbs and Dale Nish had gouges and only Dell Stubbs really knew how to use it. Uh, Dale wasn't that good at it at that stage. Um, Was that the uh, Sorby kangaroo series um, of tools? Probably, yes. I can't remember. They all had yellow handles. Yeah, I, yellow handles. I bought a lathe and it came with 13 unused kangaroo sorby tools. Yeah, yes. Well, they would have been, uh, I mean, definitely carbon steel. Uh, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yes, no, they, um, no, they it made a huge difference, uh, really, when, um, when they went to the high-speed steel. And, and I think the kind of history of that um, in, in Britain was that craft supplies, uh, when they started, um, Dick Davidson, who started that company, uh, uh, had a family connection. And I think his father owned Sorby's. Um, and 
they were chuck manufacturers as well. So uh, in Britain, we had everything slightly ahead of you guys. And then Craft Supplies USA started in 82, I think. And um, uh, they, they were wise enough to grab the name for the States uh, before Craft Supplies UK got over there. And, uh, and they, did, they, they did a huge amount to really popularize the craft and, and develop tools for the States. Glenn Eggers, um, uh, the wood, well, a lot of the wood turn, uh, manufacturers of tools have gone to the carbide bits, round and square, triangle. Have you used any of those? What do you think of them? Uh... I have used them and I don't think a lot of them generally. Um, my experience is that they, they lose their ultra sharp edge pretty quickly. Um, they're probably good for hogging out stuff inside bowls for, um, uh, they probably last fairly, fairly long time, but uh, they're not half as easy to sharpen as standard tools, I think. Um, they seem to be incredibly expensive. Um, and you very rarely see a good finish off the tool in the demonstrations. Um, and the few people who've turned up to workshops um, with complete sets of, uh, of uh, those tools um, tend to have uh, sold them shortly after and uh, started to use traditional tools. So I think, I think it's, it's Yes, I, I think they're rather a pity in many ways, but anyway, they're very successful, very good marketing. Um, but uh, I'd rather not have anything to do with them myself. Okay. Yeah. I've found that they are pretty easy to resharpen. But uh... I, no, it still won't change my mind, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I mean, there were other problems to do with the fact that they wouldn't get into where I wanted them to. So uh, okay. uh, I, I really can't remember now. It was years ago, and uh, uh, I was just. Uh, but mostly, I'm I'm disappointed that they take people away from the joys of uh, cutting wood properly with a slicing tool. I'm Welling from Northwest Wood Turners, uh, Richard. I've had the pleasure of taking some of your workshops, and I have to observe. you look familiar you look familiar <laughs> <laughs> i saw myself go by in that picture of the 213 workshop at craft supplies oh, that was um, <laughs> i uh, have to say that as a trained educator dealing with middle school students one of the things i most appreciate about you is how nimble you are on your feet as a teacher just going through if something goes wrong you go through what you do to fix it. And uh, that is a skill that I attempt to emulate as much as I can. My question for you is, um, you have done some experimenting with uh, asymmetri asymmetrically ground gouges. And I'd like to know a little more about your adventures with that notion and how you got there and where you've taken it since I last saw you. Well, I probably haven't taken it very far since I last saw you, but I um, alluded to it just now. The earlier question was that when with the first gouges I had back in 1970, I kept catching the left wing of the tool when I was hollowing bowls. Um, and so my solution was to take the wing away. Um, and uh, having taken and I kept the right wing pretty, pretty square. Uh, and I ended up with a gouge, which was uh, probably ground back, um, just trying to assess it now, but probably about three quarters of an inch, uh, fairly full curve. Uh, the angle on the nose of the tool was close on um, 45 degrees, and it kind of varied up to uh, probably 50 degrees, what you these days call a bottom feeder. Uh, so I could go around the bowl, rolling the gouge over as I went, and I could do a cut in, in one go. Um, and that's what I've always used. Um, we're discussing with Dale Nish in about 1983 uh, whether to market it, uh, to have it as part of the signature range. 
and it was reckoned that it was just too difficult for people to grind, therefore no point in putting it in the signature tool range. It's one of the great missed opportunities of life because everybody else has jumped on the bandwagon and, and I just had to make do with my set of scrapers. <laughs> so uh, that was that. But it's um, the big advantage really is, uh, I did a video on it, I think, and um, it, the left wing takes off a lot of material very quickly and the steep right wing uh, allows you to get into a fairly uh, dramatic um, concave curve. So if you've got a bowl, you know, kind of outflowing, uh, you can do the outside very easily um, because the angle of the bevel gives you a better angle of approach um, to the cut. It just makes everything more comfortable. Does that more or less answer it? Yes. I that does answer. Uh, thank you very much. I've tinkered around with them and I've enjoyed them and I've got some perspective now. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, really, and when you when you come down the inside, um, you because the wings square, I think it takes the wood out a bit faster than it does if it's um, I mean, it, it just takes a, a, war, a broader shaving on the inside. Because traditional tools are always ground straight across the bowl, the bowl tools. Stephen Strawn, your turn. Richard, I really appreciate you uh, providing this presentation to us tonight, and we've, we've enjoyed your books and, and uh, your YouTube videos. I'm, I'm a little bit curious about your experience with the negative rake scraper, and, and, and is, is really the, the bottom line of that is making sure that, that that leading edge, that point with a good burr is, is really the piece or the part that you want touching the wood or do you have better advice than that? Well, no, I mean, a, a scraper, scraper, I mean, the edge is, I mean, most of my scrapers have uh, a very slightly radiused edge. I, I don't have a completely square end, I don't think. Uh, I might have one for boxes, but I think they're all slightly skewed. Um, but uh, there's, there's a, there is a YouTube video on my grinding the the scrapers so that would probably show you what's what um as to whether you have a burr or not generally i take i i grind everything on an 80 grit cbn wheel um when i was in olympia i uh, the workshop there we had uh, we had two lots of 80 grit wheels and we also had some 180s and really it, it was very difficult to tell the difference between the two edges um and they were both fairly well-worn wheels um, and I got I needed to get a new wheel and I got rid of the 180 and uh, and bought an 80 and I, that's what I'm using now they take some breaking in but once they're broken in um, you know the the new 80 grit wheel works like a 36 it's pretty aggressive and then after about half an hour or so it's it's um it settles down <laughs> So, so my 300 grit is probably the wrong grit for-, for Well, I, I find it just takes longer to do, but, you know, I, I watch, I mean, I've been involved with, with, with several conversations online with these things on the, in, the, in the groups. Um, and there tends to be a conversation as to whether um, you should have 80 or, uh, or uh, 360 or 800 or whatever it is. And then the professionals come in and say, we use 80 and the conversation goes elsewhere. We're ignored, so anyway. Um, but uh, I think with, um, uh, I'm interested, yes. Um, the, um, I think the edge, when you get down to, if you're turning something really hard, like uh, African blackwood, end grain or cocobolo, then I would hone that edge. Uh, but generally I like a little bit of a burl on the scrapers I'm using in the bowls, you know, and um, it's more than the lightness of touch which makes the difference. Uh, and the touch has got to be, you know, when you rub your hands under a hot air dryer, it's that kind of pressure. Sure, sure. Any further, and you're likely to be in trouble. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Dale Larson, your turn. I wanted to show Richard his bowl. This is the right. burrow bowl. And it's a quarter inch. I measured it just to. Uh, ah, looks good. No, I enjoyed that. 
Now, what what um, what grinder do you use, Dale? Uh, Eighty grit for my uh, gouges, and I use uh, I still have one of Glazer's gouges that I use for all my roughing because right. of the edge. And I use a one eighty for my scrapers, the CBN one eighty for right. the scrapers. Pretty good, right? Thank that you. almost answers adds to the previous question. It's nice to see that again. Right. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Good. Thanks, Richard.